Hi there, friends, and welcome to episode 7 of my tutorial series for RimWorld. Am I gone and today? Well, this is ought to be the great security episode I was uh, preparing for a while. So today I want to fortify this base, or at least lay down the blueprints for that, and explain to you guys my decisions about that. Because this is all nice and dandy, but it is eventually not enough to fight back all the enemies that will come towards you. So we will have to work around this to make this place more safe. The best way to achieve that is to work with walls. So usually the most players love to have a base layout which has three closed sides and one open side. So basically we funnel our enemies into one certain direction and force them to attack us somewhere. Meanwhile, Pi is desperately trying to hunt down that bunny. Don't mind her. Him, sorry. And... Oh! We're being raided by the Thieber Society one more time. So, we we are now, at this point, no longer, uh, no longer strangers to this game. So, we're going to put up our people and take this guy down. Whenever this happens during the night times, it is actually smarter to just wait, especially if your enemy is preemptively preparing. But, since I want to get rid of these, uh, this guy quick, we're going to do this real quick, because he's not really helping here. And here is the ancient danger warning. Basically, every map has one spot of ancient danger. Inside this room, it's always a regular structure, you will find a couple of enemies which are stronger than the stuff you're usually facing here. And most of the time, you know, it's actually always either mechanoids inside there or insectoids. Both types of enemies I will explain sometime later. So we already got a lucky shot on Wraith. As you see here, it's uh, we're dealing with the situation just like we dealt with the same situation the last time. The first couple of raids are mostly a warm-up and you can't really take them too serious. In case you manage to not kill your enemies just like that, like I did here, this is always a good opportunity to recruit somebody to your place, but well, as we see here, not happening today. Okay, but that's fine. We want to talk about defenses anyways, so I already kind of like made up my mind how to do this, but I want to explain what I'm doing here a little bit more thoroughly. So, first off, you should always try to choose a type of stone which is quite pre um, available in your environment, because... Sometimes there are certain stone types less available than others, but that's that's mostly due to modded content, so don't take it uh, too serious. If you are wondering if there are better or worse stones for walls, actually there there are there are different uh, types of wall which you can uh, different uh, qualities of stone there. But if you really 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 want to know it, as far as I remember. Granite walls were the most solid ones here, 510. Marble walls are the least solid ones and they feature a beauty rating. That's uh, quite interesting to know that with marble walls you can actually beauty up a place. And well, sandstone lies in between. So limestone and granite are your strongest uh, friends and sandstone is the third rank. Then comes slate and you shouldn't build with marble for defenses basically. Okay, we're now we're now knowing or, or now now I know that I'm going to work with limestone. So we're going to put up some walls. If you are wondering where and how you want to put up your walls, the easiest uh, rule of thumb, in my opinion, is that you try to never mind me uh, um, putting down solar panels into research that you're trying to put down the, the smallest amount of wall to make this place safe. So in my scenario, I would go for something like that here. So one piece of wall here, one piece of wall there. Since that pond here, here, this icon, you can 
display the terrain affordance since that pawn here is kind of like a problem for my defensive structures i'm going to build quite generously around it this time so here we already have limestone walls out of a natural ruin that's even better so we're going to use that just like this actually never mind me here i'm going to make it like that Ooh. So now we have this locked off and that locked off. Now we're going to spread that over to this place. Uh, I'm going a little bit further here because it's two reasons. I want to have the ancient danger ruins inside my base. And also I want to acquire this little steel deposit here. It would be unfortunate to have that outside my base, don't you agree? So now we are safe from this side, that side, and that side. Now this only leaves us open with the question, where do we want to say hi to our enemies? I personally will go here for this decision. There we go. And that'll lead us to all enemies swarming towards us from here. And that's something I like to work with. So this is, of course, a really large scale building project. And I highly recommend you to do this only after you have consolidated your, your base like I did here. So basically, we have all the things we need. We have a steady supply of food. We have fields. We have power. We have sleeping areas for everybody. We even have a prison which can be used for a new person or for prisoners. So we're pretty well off. The only thing that's now missing is doors. I really do like to have doors inside my defenses. Let's uh, cut some stones here because I can't select limestone anymore, which is kind of frustrating. So in this scenario now, because I know that I'll need a lot of limestone blocks. I'll do a bill which puts up well, 2000 maybe, 200, which puts up limestone blocks on a higher priority than any stone block because I don't, I actually don't want Emmanuel to, to cut marble blocks right now. We don't need them that much. And this way there's gonna be always a steady supply of limestone. Okay, so. I like to place down stone doors in my exterior walls, even though they are super slow and actually bad doors and not really not really not really user friendly. But there's a certain reason for that. I always build my defenses like that, and I never uh, I've, I've never been sorry about it a single time because this way. Wherever my people on the map are, they can't enter my base. Sure, these doors are weak spots now, you might think, because the door will have less HP than the wall, but raiders never ever attack doors. Animals also not attack doors. Mechanoids also not attack doors, unless they see somebody slipping through that door. And even then, most of the time they don't destroy that door entirely. So. Long story short behind that, doors are not really a weak spot in your defenses. I've seen a lot of people preferring wooden doors or steel doors in their outside areas because of the very slow opening time and I've heard people saying that the stone doors were quite often a death trap for their people. So if that's bothering you, you can of course pick the quick opening wooden doors, or if you don't want a that weak door, we will take a steel door instead. I personally prefer the stone doors because I always made the experience that it's okay to have them. And if you ever if I ever run into the problem that somebody outside is in dire need of running towards that door, I'll take somebody from inside the base and open the door already for him. That's a little trick. But enough of that, I think you got the picture about these things. So now today we're going to build these things. This is going to be a huge endeavor and therefore I think it's about time that we order our good friend, our good friends here to actually at least 
think about this work as something they might want to do. All right, let's send Emmanuel to bed. As you saw here, I sent him to work there and he's already pretty roughed up. Whenever you send somebody to work somewhere, keep in mind that you have to clear this prioritized work. Otherwise, they will work until they fall, not, not fall unconscious, but they, they really overwork themselves. So whenever you assign somebody somewhere, keep in mind that you need to unassign them after, after a certain amount of time. Okay, so now that with that being said and done, I want to optimize my kitchen here at this point. So I didn't uh, build the kitchen correctly in the first place. So, we're going to do this today. Because here, about the defense system, there's not much more to add as of now. We just need to build that thing. About the kitchen, though, there's one thing. When you check out the cookery chances... What was my cook again? Okay, we get into the information screen. And now we check out food poison chance. So, as you see here, there's a. Why is that hopping away? There's a certain chance of acquiring food or, or spreading food poisoning while preparing meals. The higher your cooking rate is, the better, the lower the chance for food poisonings spreading. And there's another modifier for food poisonings, and that's the cleanliness of the kitchen room so basically what you want to have is a clean as possible kitchen room there's a neat little trick to do that or at least to achieve that as few people as possible enter and leave the kitchen and that's to give that kitchen only one strategical entrance that's only usable by the cook that's what we're going to do. By the way, I did want to activate the replace stuff mod in the last episode, but sadly, that wasn't possible because it's not updated for version 1.3 yet. So we'll have to work entirely without mods still. I could go for the Achtung mod, but well, I kind of was frustrated when my favorite uh, replace stuff mod wasn't activated anymore. So here we go. And now we're going to replace that with real stone walls. So with that now happening, the kitchen will have only one entrance for the cook. And since nobody ever will enter the room where the, the stove is standing, except for the person who's actually going to cook, there's not going to be any unnecessary traffic through that room. So that means if you want to keep your kitchen clean, try to have it a connected directly to your food sources and have it only one way access so only your cook will enter and leave that place. This way you can avoid other people getting in there. There's also the problem with animals getting in there and spreading dirt, but since I want to explain animal interactions in an entirely uh, dedicated episode, we're going to leave our little Yorkshire Terrier, Tom, naughty as he wants to be. So, lucky Tom. Usually my dogs are not allowed to behave like that. So, we now, I'll now place down a couple of building orders for marble tiles, because, you know, tiles are less dirty than dirt. This is really important to note. And now we're building that wall and building that wall. Wall building is a very lengthy process. And that's why I always emphasize having passionate constructors, at least one in your colony, because otherwise these projects take even longer and that can be quite nasty. Also, I want to note here that this steam geyser here actually it would have been smarter to build a little nose around that. I have to explain my mistake later in another episode when it makes more sense. But sometimes it's quite cool to make mistakes on purpose. So Emmanuel is heat stroking. How does that come together? It's the first of Jugos and outside temperatures have reached 42 degrees. This is outright massive. And as we see here, 
everybody or well not everybody but many people will suffer from heat strokes soon because pi is only tolerating 36 degree Emmanuel even only 29 degree as you see here the cowboy hats are really making a difference so what are we going to do because of that because if you check out the health tab here this heat stroke meter once it hits 100 percent the person is dead so this is the this is a lethal condition you should take it serious but don't you worry it's easy to avert that there's two ways how you can deal with that first if you have energy and resources to no end you can just smack coolers on into the the, the rooms here and then your folks will just flee inside these rooms or you can draft them and let them cool off inside these rooms or you take the eco non-energy using version the passive cooler the passive cooler costs you 50 wood to build and will always try to regulate the room temperature towards 21 degrees celsius it can bring the temperature lower than 21 degrees celsius and if the temperature is already below 21 degrees celsius like 10 degree the passive cooler of course won't warm up your room because it's a cooler not a heater but what it does now as you see here in that small room it's slowly dropping the temperature check this line if you are if you haven't looked at it so outdoors temperature is 41 degree mouse over in this room we see the indoors temperature of this room is dropping to really really cool temperatures so this way we're going to no no Emmanuel, you're going to build that we're now going to build one passive cooler inside every apartment yeah poor Emmanuel. he has to suffer for this now but now everybody is safe so here we see he's suffering from a heat stroke already if you aren't or able to do stuff like that because you're too low on wood or whatever keep in mind as long as there's one room like this uh, cooler room here which has a lower indoors temperature your people will automatically flee towards a room which is cold enough to avoid death so if you ever are grow too too worried about these situations just keep in mind as long as there's one room which uh, enables the people to lose their heat stroke you're basically safe off. so usually you die of heat strokes only during extreme heat wave periods or in really hot environments like the desert when you weren't prepared for for this place stuff like that can't happen so now i'm placing down my benches to the wall again and as i mentioned a couple of episodes ago we're going to put in some light here as well because dark rooms are lowering the work efficiency and since there's a lot of work happening inside these apartments i feel like it's a smart choice to give them some light to work with so once these walls are complete we will be able to just wait for the raiders and attack us but this is by no means the end of our preparations this is just the beginning of our fortress so there are two ways how we can pull this off we have then to decide either to fight our enemies in this corridor or prepare a combat corridor at this area i personally will go prefer the the combat area here and we're going to leave this open i i am a big fan of building very very large and extensive bases which yield a lot of room to kite enemies across i've seen a lot of other people building more compact bases with more defined so-called kill boxes which are just meant to make the enemy's life as hard as possible to actually get towards your people and well i'm going to explain kill boxes when it's time for that what i want to say at this point is you can either build compact with a very very mm, with very deadly and well-defined defense area or you build a larger complex with a little bit of a less defined combat zone 
that's basically it. Because with kiting, you can solve a ton of problems as well. There's many ways uh, to win Rick World, and if you wonder why I am doing this, this is not only because I think uh, kill zones are a little bit lame, uh, kill boxes. Hate me for that if you want to. I also made the experience that. Uh, well, we're going to talk about that in a sec. That if you are closing yourself too much in, the events shift to something I don't like. You must know that the AI storyteller of RimWorld is actually trying to give you attacks which work well against your colony. There's siege events and sapper events which try to breach your defenses, and guess what? They happen more often the more the harder it is to enter your base. Basically, if you just build a cube which is enclosed entirely by walls, the AI storyteller would try to send as many sappers and sieges and airdrop enemies which land directly in your base as possible to counter your strategies. So the storyteller will always try to send threats which are a threat to you. The AI storyteller actually optimizes its threats to, to endanger you. So, this is uh, one thing which makes you, which should make you feel important, but it also means that I didn't like to build too entrenched and too compact defense compounds in general. But there's really nothing bad about building a kill box design. If if you like that, just just Google, uh, just go on YouTube and search for kill box designs. There's really awesome stuff outside there. I did a rather short one about this topic, which is the featuring those things in a rather quick way, with not too many details about optimal setups and such, because I'm a big fan of teaching people how to find their optimal setup for themselves. But a couple of other YouTubers really made awesome stuff, which I can only um, recommend if you want to go down deep and dirty with the details. So we have finally our first mental breakdown. Ha! <laughs> I was waiting for that. So Emmanuel, he he's really he he had it enough. So his final straw was that he su was suffering from intense pain. How did that come together? I I watched it uh, happen. We have a food poisoning on him. Food poisoning is a non-lethal disease. Unlike lethal diseases, it just passes after a while, and what it does, it modifies your your stats. So, food poisoning comes with an, an initial phase, major phase, and recovery phase. Right now, poor old Emmanuel is in the major phase. This means he's suffering from an extra 40% of pain, his consciousness got multiplied by 50%, which means his uh, consciousness is cut in half, his moving is cut in half too, and uh, his manipulation is also reduced, his blood filtration is reduced. This is important if you are suffering from something like a flu, where you're actively, or an infection, where you're actively fighting against it with your immunity. And he's also worse at talking, and also his eating time has been massively increased. Due to the pain he's been suffering, he decided to throw a tantrum. So you can check it out here. Intense pain, minus 15 mood. You see, this guy really has a bad day. So, a tantrum. Every mental breakdown will have a little bit of a description in this uh, box here. He will smash up random furniture, items, and tech and structures. So, mm, when somebody's tantruming, they, they just run around and uh, start backing stuff, as you see here. He's just running around and uh, randomly hits some walls and the doors, and this is usually one of the most harmless tantrum uh, mental breakdowns, and I can only recommend you to just uh, bear with it. If you don't want to bear with it, though, there's a neat little trick. Put one, Turn one of your rooms into a prison. Right-click the person that's ranting there. Has to be allowed to warden, so... Because Pi is incapable of social work, this doesn't work. And wait a sec, you can't arrest people without mods. <laughs> okay, never mind. I can't arrest him because I, I, I seemingly, this is not a vanilla option. Okay, you can't do anything about it. 
Well, there is one thing which you could do about that, and that's uh, go over there and punch them. Punch them. Don't shoot them. You don't want to kill your people. But this will, especially in this scenario, because he's already suffering from a lot of pain, he will then just go unconscious and stop his mental breakdown. This always works. When they go unconscious, their uh, mental breakdowns are over. So I have to answer the doorbell real quick. All right, pardon the interruption. So where was I? Yeah. So you could punch him down and then rescue him. You can do that with practically every mental breakdown. Sometimes that's necessary because sometimes your people just decide to random, randomly murder people or, or slaughter your animals or or try to punch that atomic, uh, that uh, anti-materia nuke in your storage. It's deadly, by the way. So sometimes it's better to punch down somebody when he's in a mental breakdown, but you shouldn't do if you can because if you check this out, after having a mental breakdown, your people are experiencing cathartic feelings because it was good to unbottle their feelings and you get a massive mood bonus for a couple of days. This is basically the a, a kind of a protection for your character to not go mental right again after being already mental. So we have covered this up and this is a this defense will already work quite well for us in, in many ways. So there's one thing which we need to put up here, and that's some sandbags or barricades. Sandbags uh, and barricades, there is not too much difference except for a couple of stats. Main, main difference is sandbags are made out of leathers, whereas barricades are made out of uh, more solid materials. We're going to just put up uh, some, some wooden barricades not more than that. These give your marksman cover while fighting. Basically, it's harder to, to get hit while you're hiding behind a barricade. Pretty useful stuff. Also, you want to reduce the possible amount of cover for your enemies when you build corridors like that. You have to keep in mind your enemies can also hide behind trees, so you might want to manipulate this area here too but since we aren't done with this by no, we're, we're, we will work a lot on this uh, still so this is a nice start with this you can hide and wait for strong ranged enemies just to get in there so we have a we have a first uh, trade company arriving. wonderful this fills the last few minutes quite well so here we see a slaver from the people of Pesa is approaching. So first thing we need to do, we need to check out who's the best social guy in the colony. In this scenario, this is Bubbles. Then we look for the person with the yellow question mark. In case you have trouble finding them, you can always click that uh, message here, jump to location, and we'll always focus onto this guy. If you struggle with finding that because it disappears here, you can always check out the history here, go to messages, and here you can click that thing one more time and jump back to the trader. Happens to me uh, quite often that I need this. So we're right clicking now the uh, other party's trader with our own social butterfly and then walking over there. And now you see up here is the negotiator line to explain all that, all this down here in a minute. But you see, we have a 12% bonus while trading because of the high social value. That's why I want to emphasize social skills there. So the left side is our stuff and the right side is the other people's stuff. So here you see the amount of items for we have, our money, and the amount of items they have and their money. So the slavers are selling pemmican, this is food, and people, well, pretty pretty obvious here, Rosalina and Vector are for sale. And we can here sell our stuff with these uh, arrows and we can buy their stuff with these arrows. Sadly, well, I'm going to try and make a trade here. Limestone sculpture and packaged survival meals for Rosalina. Well, as you see here, we are 
we have to pay 953 silver. We only have 800, so sorry, Rosalina. I'm not going to give away my last few components for you. If you are buying uh, slaves from people here, always keep in mind that you can and should check them out here because who would have uh, wanted to free Rosalina in the first place? So Vector, I'm pretty sure he would be the better choice, but yeah, also incapable of dumb labor and firefighting. Also very important, check out the health tab. Sometimes they try to sell you in people with addictions and horrible health conditions and whatnot. So since we don't want to buy anything here and I actually don't want to sell my food or my statue, this just served as a uh, quick basic tutorial about how the trade menu works. I find it quite intuitively, so feel free to ask away if I did cut that a little bit short. One last thing though is worth mentioning. Down with the shopping cart icon here, you can check out what kind of items these people actually would buy, because every trader has a different shopping list. And also the gift icon here transforms your um, your trade screen into a gift screen and what happens here is that you can gift people stuff and you see down here behind the brackets you see that plus eight you can also give money plus 18 this is the amount of faction goodwill you will gain for gifting them a present right now we don't want to gift anything i just wanted to explain that okay so up here are some sorting thingies i didn't really ever touch them because i grew accustomed to this system here so like i said if there are any questions left ask away i find that trade system is one of the le less uh, complicated things in this game okay so that was one episode we managed to put up a sort of a defense system which of course needs to be built still and we have to cut stones like crazy the next couple of uh, episodes but at least we now have a goal which can be achieved and since there's plenty of limestone lying around i'm pretty sure in the long run we will we will get that done meanwhile our colony is suffering from food poisoning <laughs> There's only a 0.25 person chance for that happening, but as you see here, it still happens. Okay, friends, so that was today's episode. Thank you so much for watching. Next episode, I will go a little bit deeper into the research topics because I did not put up a new research job here after researching the solar panels. We're going to build a couple of solar panels, of course, too. And I'm going to deepen the whole defense topic a little bit more because I feel like we we are not done here. I want to I want to solidify this defense here and talk a little bit about other options we have because this is just a very very basic grid. But once it's built, it will help us a ton. Okay, so thanks for watching, guys. Drop your comments down below, questions, whatever. I'm more than happy to answer them. Leave a thumbs up on that video series and. At this point, thanks for all the, the awesome comments and feedback. You really, really know how to make me happy. And last but not least, if you like this content, check out my channel, subscribe, turn on those notifications and you won't miss anything in the future. Also, check out the description box down there. You'll find my Twitch channel there where I do daily streams. So check that out too if you want to. And last but not least, check out my Patreon links and all the other uh, support stuff down here if you want to do that. I'd be more than happy. But if you don't want to, I don't mind either. Just let me say thanks one more time for watching. This is the biggest support of them all. See you soon. Bye-bye.